test your knowledge on page 61 for the lesson on repentance. And uh, if we get through, we'll go ahead into the next lesson. I feel like I need to ask somebody to go put another log on the fire. And and Janet was giving me encouraging news this morning. She's looking at her phone and she said, "Guess what? Next weekend it's supposed to do the same thing. Be in the 30s and like rain Saturday. Yeah, it's supposed to." <sighs> so I will. I, I don't. I don't have any problem with heat. I, I just wish, it, to me, it could be 95 every day and I'd be fine with it. I just don't like the cold. <sighs> and, and I'll tell you why, because if, if I want to do anything and I bundle up because it's cold, then I start sweating. You know, and it's like, well, if you take it off, you're going to start freezing again. So it's like, I don't know. Well, you're right, though. We need to, we need to be thankful. I'm thankful I'm in here right now, that's for sure. Let's start our class with a prayer, and then we'll get into our activity page. Father, we're thankful that you have blessed us in so many ways, that you have watched over us and cared for us, brought us to this point in time today that we have the privilege of gathering and that uh, we can study your word and worship unmolested. We know, Father, that's not the case in in all parts of the world. We pray, Father, for those who come together in difficult circumstances. We pray that in some way they may uh, be relieved of the burden of threats or the pressures of um, trying to meet together to worship. We pray, Father, that you will increase their faith, help us to be mindful of other people, uh, such as us that come together to worship but have to struggle with uh, outside influences. We pray, Father, that as we come here freely and to study and worship, that we've come for no other purpose but to, to gain a better appreciation for your will and to put that into practice in our lives, and that we're here to strengthen one another and to build each other up. We're here to praise and glorify you and your son. We pray, Father, you bless us today in our study. Help us to uh, continue to see the ways that our lives can be improved. We pray, Father, that we'll understand that we have come out of sin. We appreciate the opportunity that has been given to us to change our lives, and we pray, Father, that we have done that, and we continue to do that as we live before you. This morning, as we gather, we're mindful of many who are unable to be with us. We pray that you'll be with them to those who are administering to them. We pray that their health may be restored, if at all possible. But if not, Father, we pray that you'll give them the peace and the comfort and the understanding that if they're your children, that they are taken care of and they will be uh, given the comfort and peace uh, throughout their life. We pray, Father, that you'll continue with us today as we worship. We pray, Father, that we bring before you fruits that will be sweet-smelling, and that they will please you in what we do with our lives and how we come today. We pray, Father, that we'll never lose sight of the sacrifice of your son, that he would go to such extent that he would pour out his blood at Calvary that we might have forgiveness of sins and hope of life eternal. We pray, Father, that you'll be with us every day of our lives, We pray that you will help us and guide us in the way in which you want us to go. 
May we influence others. May we be uh, those who are not identified with this world, but those who stand apart. And those who have the opportunity to hear the gospel, we pray that they might have open ears and hearts, and that they might at least be given the opportunity to examine the truth. And we pray, Father, that if, if at all possible, that they would come to a knowledge and obedience. We pray that you'll be with us today. We pray that you'll continue with us in the days ahead. And we pray, Father, that one day heaven will be our home. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, page 61. We'll start the activities. Number one. This is a uh, quote from uh, Luke 19.10. And it, it gives a, a, a very meaningful purpose for why Jesus has come to this earth. And um, he says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And those are pretty powerful words. The idea of, of seeking uh, Jesus didn't come here and say, well, you know, I'm the son of, son of God. Uh, a lot of times referred to as the son of man, as in this passage. Uh, the idea of him seeking. He didn't come and sit and say, okay, well, everybody come to me and, uh, you know, tell me what your problems are and talk to me. He went out seeking people. And, and you know, just the idea of... of of that process. Um, in other passages, we'll read where Jesus is the good shepherd. Well, and there's references to those, the lost sheep, and, and there's, there's parables to that in that regard. The idea that Jesus came seeking us, he came pursuing us. Now, how many times do we pursue our enemies? Well, I know we pursue them in battle to try to destroy them, but how many times would you go pursue those who are contrary to, to what you stand for and ask for you to come and be a part uh, of something? I mean, if you have an ornery neighbor, how many times do you try to go over there and talk to him? Probably not too many times. Well, could you imagine Jesus coming here and seeking us and wanting us to, to be a part of his kingdom. And so that, that idea in itself, that Jesus didn't come here and, and just sit idly by for things to happen around him. He came here seeking and wanting to save those which were lost. And um, so when he comes to, to this earth and he sees people, he's compassionate, he's kind, he's wanting them to come listen to his message and to know the truth. And so that, that's an, it's an interesting thing. So if he's seeking us, the, the passage sort of explains itself. If, if he's seeking us, then where are we? We're lost. And, you know, we have trouble sometimes recognizing that or dealing with that. If we get up every day and say that everything that I owe uh, now that I've been obedient to the gospel, is to the fact that Jesus Christ came to this earth, gave himself up, and made it possible for me to be in a relationship with him and his Father. If we think about that every day, then that should motivate us to live the kind of life so that we need to live. Now, you ever been in a situation where you had to drag your child out of a store or some other place, kicking and screaming? Nobody's ever done that, have they? Well, you think sometimes that it seems that way uh, with our lives? You know, we want to go to heaven, right? I mean, if we take a poll, how many people want to go to heaven? And if, if everybody is just totally honest, do you want to go to a place Given the options, you want to go to a place that has beauty and is peaceful and, and all these great things, or do you want to go to a place that's tormented, 
and burning and lake of fire and, and all the things that we hear about associated with hell. How many people are going to say, I want to go to hell? Only those who are not in their right mind. Right? But how many times do we go along with God kicking and screaming? And see, that's what this lesson is about. Repentance should be such that when he comes to us and he says, you're in sin and you're lost, then we gladly follow him. We gladly do what he asks us to do. There's not a burden. It's not a chore. And if we look at, at our religious life in terms of a chore, something's wrong. And so we need to understand what he did for us, where we were, and what we came out of. And remind ourselves every day that we live our lives and we are who we are by the grace of God. Number two, considering the destructive nature of sin and the loving grace of God, penitent people have a change of heart and mind that leads to a change of life and behavior. And, you know, that, that is a, a wonderful statement. It's all biblically based. It's not a passage in Scripture, but it's all biblically based. Sin is destructive. Now, sin is enticing. There's no doubt about that. But we learn from um, the writer of the book of Hebrews as he talks about um, the, the joys of sin for what? A season. I mean, it's not like sin's not uh, enticing. Some things, some parts about it. The lust, our own desires, our selfishness leads us into sin because we want something. But the end, end the result of it is destructive. Sin is damaging. And, uh, you know, we could start talking about different sins um, this morning. And, and when we finally get through with all of it, we would have come to the conclusion that every sin is destructive somewhere down the line. It may be enticing at first, it may be alluring, but the end result is destruction. And so when you consider that, and that's where we are, it's where God finds us in this destructive world of sin, there's a change that's got to take place. And it's because God's love that we have that opportunity. We don't deserve that. God didn't have to come in into our lives and say, well, you know, you need to better yourselves or you need to, this would be better for you. He didn't have to do that, but he did because he loves us. Now, how we describe and, and understand that love, it, it's hard to fathom because um, we typically love those who love us, right? That's, that's how... The human nature is. If, if somebody treats you good, you normally treat them good. If somebody treats you bad, you treat them. Uh, they treat you bad, you treat them bad. And, and yet God, knowing that we're in this dire state, loved us and made it possible for us. But it requires us to have a change of heart and mind. And it's not just simply... Uh, a mental statement or a mental uh, state of mind that says, okay, I'm in sin, I repent. Repentance goes far beyond, it, it, it is a change. There's a difference. It's as if this person that existed one day in sin because of the gospel and obedience to the gospel is not the same person. They may look the same, uh, have the same features, not going to change physically, but internally there's great changes taking place. Their hearts have said, I don't want to sin anymore. Their minds have made determination not to sin anymore. 
and there's a change that takes place. They're a different person. And uh, we need to understand that repentance requires us to change our life and behavior. I can't keep doing the things that I did that were wrong just because I've, you know, gone through the process of obeying the gospel, being baptized. Uh, if we understand what all that's about, there's not a problem. But if we think that we can go through this process, uh, yeah, let me check off the box. I did this, I did this. What's next? Yeah, I did that. And then I did this, so therefore I'm good. That's, that's not repentance. We repent the rest of our lives. We repent over the things that are wrong. We are constantly changing. And we're a different person than we used to be. Now, there may be people who were just as, we use the term, maybe good as gold. But there's still a change in their lives. You talk to them. I used to not believe in God. I was a person that didn't do bad things. I was good to people. I was kind. But... When Christ came into my life, he changed the way I think uh, so that, there's, there's, that I do things more than what I did. I do things maybe differently than the way I did them. But there's changes that takes place in our lives. And we've got to understand that repentance is not something that we do to say, well, I did that. I you know, went into the store. I walked in the front door. Therefore, that box is checked. Repentance is something that is part of our lives from now on, we constantly want to be someone who's serving God. We're constantly walking in the light. We're making the adjustments, the corrections of those things that are amiss. And, and that's something we have to understand. It, it, that is that change of, of behavior than what we had before. All right, number three. The Lord is not slow, 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but he is patient, so thankful for the patience of God. So thankful. Um, I mean, if you stop and think about the times in the Old Testament, when Israel angered God because of the way they were living, and yet God continued with what he planned to do, and he made it possible for us today to enjoy his patience. And there's still people today who need his patience, and uh, they've not decided yet to change their lives. Some people count that as slackness, our slowness on God's part, but it's not, that's not his nature. He's just patient toward us, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And so we have to understand that we're changing states. We're in sin but we're coming somewhere. We're coming somewhere that's different. It's a different state. It's a different place. And uh, so while we're in sin and uh, we have a knowledge that sin's not good for us, we're living in rebellion. We're telling God, I'm not changing. But when we change that state to a state of repentance, we're willing to change anything whatever it takes to please God, to put ourselves in a relationship that continues uh, with God and His Son. And so, He's not wanting anybody to perish. He's given us ample opportunities, but there, that, that will not last forever. And so, while the patience of God is still present, we need to encourage people to come out of that state of sin and come to repentance. That's where they're going to have the opportunity to be able to live with God eternally. Number four. It was our sins, our lust, and our selfishness that sent Jesus to the cross. 
And this is a, a, a concept or a, an understanding of the teaching of scriptures that is a little bit um, hard for us to understand. I mean, if you were, if you were to ask a, a, a group of people today uh, that had, did not have good Bible knowledge about God's plan, but they had a general understanding that there was this Christ who died on the cross, who would they say crucified Christ? They would say the people in his day, the people in his day wanted him crucified. They may say the religious leaders, they might say the, the crowd uh, that was, was present at the time. How many of us would think about that our sin today, that Jesus went to the cross, and if he was able to do that once and for all, and not have to continually offer sacrifices, but he could do it one time, then don't you understand that he would have to do it for all the sins? Even those sins which in our minds, from a time perspective, haven't been committed yet? You understand the concept that 20 years down the road, there's an individual, as long as this world is going to exist, continue to exist, Somewhere down the road, 20 years from now, there's an individual who will recognize that sin is in their lives and they need to repent. You think Jesus went to the cross for the sins of somebody in the future? Well, obviously he did. And that's sort of hard for us to understand that our sins, our selfishness, our attitudes are what put Jesus on the cross. And we don't think about that that much, do we? Not typically. We don't think we put Jesus on the cross. It was those people back there in his day that were hogging out crucify him. But sin is the reason that Jesus went to the cross. And sin is present wherever mankind lives. And so when you start to think about that, all of man's sins put Jesus on the cross. Our lust, our selfishness, and those are things that we need to get rid of. If we, if we really appreciate the sacrifice that Jesus made, we come to understanding the truth of the gospel, we need to put those things behind us. Now, that doesn't mean we're not going to make mistakes, but we've changed our mind and our hearts. Our desire is not to fulfill our own selfish lust. Our desire is to try to do the best we can to serve God. And so we, we change ourselves, but don't think for just a moment that we're not guilty of putting Jesus on the cross. Number five, people can be so deceived by the devil that they think they are all right spiritually when in reality they are lost. I don't know really how to address that. I mean, there's just so much in the world today that's just amazing. I, I've talked to people in the past at work, uh, be frustrated. Guys would be frustrated with their mothers. I know one guy, he just his mother would sit and watch one of the TV evangelists um, who's sitting there just raking in money. Um, and she's, she believes every word of it. She just, she's just buying everything that's said there. And Satan has caused that kind of deceit. The fact that we feel like we're okay. Have you ever knocked doors uh, in this community and gone up to somebody and said, well, you know, we're, we're from Maysville and we're, we've got a, an outreach here to try to, to, to talk to to the people and get them to, to come and hear the truth spoken. And they say, oh, well, I go to so-and-so down the road here. What are they telling you, in other words? I'm okay. I, I, I go to services somewhere. 
some religious group. So I'm okay. It's what they're telling me. Now, who's told them that lie? Well, it ultimately goes back to Satan. Satan has put so many lies out in the religious world that there continues to be nothing but chaos. Now, how do you find your way through all that to find the truth? How do you do that? Well, you have to want to. You have to want to know the truth. When you start hearing someone say such and such, such and such, and you say, well, where's that found in the Bible? And uh, here's someone who's sincere, and they're part of some religious group, and they say, well, that's not what the Bible says. That there's, you know, there's a little lot that goes on, a little question mark that should, should flare up that says, well, wait a minute now, you're telling me that this is what we're supposed to believe, but the Bible doesn't say that, doesn't teach that. And I, I can see that as an honest person, even though I'm part of this religious group, why are you telling me that? And so if you want to find the truth, you can find it, but what a fog that you have to work your way through to find the truth. It's sad. And Satan has done such a job of making people believe that as long as they're religious, they're okay with God. You don't believe that? Go ask your neighbor. What religious group are you a part of? Okay. Do you believe you're going to heaven? What do you think their answer is going to be? Absolutely. What do you base that on? Well, maybe it's something like, because I've accepted Jesus. What does that mean you accepted Jesus? Well, one day somebody said, you've got to recognize that you're a sinner, and uh, you just accept Jesus. You, you agree that you're a sinner and you, you need to change. And that's what you do. Well, is that what the Bible teaches? Is that how we become a child of God? Because we, we recognize that, that Jesus exists and that we're a sinner. And we say some prayer like, Lord Jesus, uh, please be merciful to me, a sinner, and change my life or something. Well, that's, that's a good thought. It's good that people would come to that conclusion, but it's not a completion of what God has said. And so, you ask your religious friends, are you going to heaven? They're going to say, yes, going to heaven. I believe the Bible. Well, what part of it do you believe? Where did you come to an understanding of the truth? Well, my preacher, my priest, my whatever that they come up with told me, well, did you investigate whether or not it was what's in Scripture or not? Well, no, I just assumed that he's, he's an educated man in, in the Scriptures and he would lead me in the right direction. The fog that's out there is amazing. If you've ever tried to drive in very dense fog, do you know how dangerous it is? In the religious world, there's a dense fog. And people have to find the truth. We can try to help them. But Satan has deceived so many people into believing that they're spiritually okay. All right, uh, true or false? Number one, the New Testament reveals the great love that Jesus showed to sinners. True. And, and you know, that's where we started out in, uh, this morning. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. It, it, it just sort of boggles the mind. That Jesus, who is deity, and came to this earth and lived in the flesh, was seeking out sinners now if you are religious leaders we'll just start there that's just a good place as any if you're religious leaders of the Jews okay what were you about were you about trying to go find the sinners and pull them out of sin it's amazing 
Here's someone who is God in the flesh who came to this earth and was kind and looking for sinners so that they could be saved. What a concept. I mean, it just, it's just not how we are. It's not who we are. That's why it's, it's God's plan. If we had somebody that was royalty, if Jesus wasn't the humble of the humble nature that he was, let's just say that we could come up with a scenario where some, some prince from some country came over and he came for the purpose of trying to administer and take care of the poor. He wouldn't even understand how to do that. He'd lived his life in luxury and had the finest things, and yet he came to a country and was wanting to help the poor people? That's not typical of nature for, for mankind. And so Jesus came to this world and had compassion on the sinners. Now, we're going to see as we go through here, Jesus does not tolerate sin. That's interesting. But he is concerned about the individual who is sinning. And he wants a change to take place in their lives. And that concept of somebody that, that of such a, a nature, of such a level as we might think of levels, he's of the highest level and yet he comes down here instead of just trying to go ahead and get the church started or uh, get things moving in regard to establishing his kingdom. He comes down, which in our mind would be to the lowliest of people, and administers to them. The chief rulers and the, the, the religious people of the day looked upon these people in disdain, that they were just the trash of the earth, garbage. And yet Jesus came to those people because he loved the sinner, but not the sin. And that leads us to number two. Just because Jesus loved sinners doesn't mean he tolerated their sin. True. Uh, example of the, the woman called in adultery. And, of course, they're trying to, you know, catch Jesus by saying, well, the law says that she should be stoned, you know. What, what are you going to say? Because, I mean, you, you're this supposedly the son of God down here. What do, you, what do you say? And so we know the story where Jesus starts writing something in the dirt. And, and he says to them, let them who is without sin cast the first stone. He looks back up. No one's there. He asks the lady, where are your accusers? They've all disappeared. And he says, go your way and sin no more. He didn't say, go your way and try to be a better person. He didn't say, it's okay for you to be involved in adulterous situations throughout your life, just sort of space them out. No. He said, you go your way and you sin no more. And so when we come in contact with sin in our lives and we recognize this is not where we need to be, we've got to get as far away from that as we can. Jesus loves the sinner. He hates the sin. And we can't have sin in our lives. Number three, repentance is not optional. True or false? True. I'm going to come to God, and God's just going to accept me just like I am. I've, I've got rough edges, but I'm not changing. Okay? then God's not going to accept you. You come shaking your fist 
in the face of God, as it were, he's not going to drag you out of a store like a screaming child. He said, you're going to come serve me today. Repentance is not optional. If we're going to come to God, we must change. And we know what, we, what we're about. We know as we look at our lives, we know if we're doing things right or if we're not doing things right. We know if we're holding on to sin or, or letting it go. And uh, those things that are not right in our lives, if we are truly repentant of what we are doing and we believe that we need to let go of sin, we'll do it. Say it wasn't tough. Didn't say it was easy. But we'll do it. Because that's the only way that we can come to God is if we repent. Number four. Repentance is merely ceasing to sin. False. Okay, well... What else is involved in that? Change your life, change your heart. You don't just say, well, I got caught with that. I'm not. You, you go into the kitchen. The mother says, don't be getting any cookies out of the cookie jar. You hear the cookie jar lid rattle, and mother comes into the kitchen and says, um, told you not to get any cookies. Okay, so that's it, you know. That's good enough. Well, you'd already been told not to do that. And um, so we're talking about changing. We're talking about changing. And um, if we just say, well, okay, I'll just stop where I am, there may be some things that we have really, really messed up. We've really messed up. Now let's just say for sake of discussion, that someone has been in a uh, situation to where uh, they left the, lived the lifestyle of uh, fornication. And so, you know, as, as, as things happen, um, and, and we've, we've seen it, sadly, throughout the years, here's someone who is involved in sexual relations that shouldn't be because they're not married. And then the woman becomes pregnant. Okay? So let's just say that, uh, and uh, so they, she, she's with child and she's going to have a child. Let's just say that in that relationship they come to an understanding that um, whatever reason, Maybe that they're not going to, maybe she's, she's a certain way, she's not going to change. But let's just, just say for the sake of discussion here, just to try to make a point, that, that the young man in that relationship uh, comes to a knowledge of the truth, recognizes that he's, he's sinned. So if we think that repentance is just stop sinning, okay, he doesn't do that anymore. Well, there's a child out there now. If he is going to be the person that he's supposed to be. Is he going to change such that he recognizes he has a responsibility now? Yeah? So when we, th there's more to it. There's consequences, right? Sometimes our sins carry consequences. We may have someone out here who murders somebody. They come to knowledge of the truth. But they may still have to spend the rest of their life in prison doesn't mean that they haven't obeyed the truth and changed their lives. But they may have to spend the rest of their life in prison. And so we try to do the best we can, given the mess that we've made of cleaning it up. The best we can. If, if I've said something to somebody and it was not appropriate, and, uh, you know, there's uh, been some... Uh, separation there, maybe there was a friendship or something, and so I said, well, you know, my, my bad, I did wrong. I still need to try to go back and try to make that right and try to reconcile. 
So repentance is just not merely saying, hey, uh, I made a mistake. I'll stop doing that. It's a matter of trying to make our lives reflect what God would want us to do. Number five. Abhor what is evil means we should hate evil people. Pause. As we've said a couple of times, we hate the sin, the evil that's associated with that, but the sinner is someone that God would love and want them to change. And so if you have the idea that you hate the sin, hate the sinner, guess what? You just mark them off your list. Don't have to worry about them anymore. But that's not the way it is. And so when we see sin, sin is, is nasty. It's destructive. But that person's soul is of value to God. And we need to recognize that we want that sinner to be saved. Now that's tough. That's not an easy thing to do. But it's something that we need to learn to deal with. Okay, discussion, go through a couple of these. Define repentance. We've talked about it quite a bit this morning. Change of heart, change of mind, and it's going to be evidenced in the way that our behavior changes, isn't it? Our life is going to be different. And so we need to understand that there, there are various aspects of that. Not only repenting of what we've done, but changing that's, that's visible. Uh, inward and possibly outward. It wouldn't have to be uh, necessarily outward, but maybe um, most cases it probably would be because of the, the changes that would take place. Number two, is it difficult to repent of sins? I say sometimes it's very difficult. Sometimes it's very difficult to give up things. I have found um, one of the weaknesses that, have, that has been a part of my life, I, I just wanted to throw out here and you know, have a couch session with the psychiatrist or anything, but I, I have found that the, it, when, when something that I do in the past, uh, I've tried to learn to grow from this. Um, if something's wrong, you know what my first reaction is, which is not in the past at least, of what it, it, uh, from what it should have been, start trying to justify why that was okay. Well, that, that was okay, you know, everybody does it, or that wasn't really that bad, you know? That, that, and so you have to just sort of come face to face with it. Yeah, somebody made me do it, or I, you know, I can blame somebody. You know, we just need to recognize sins there and that repentance means we let it go. And we don't justify it. We don't say, well, you know, this is why it happened kind of thing. Um, but it, it's difficult sometimes to uh, repent of sins. And uh, some changes may be easy. Some changes may be very difficult. Uh, some may things that have been in our lives for a long time that need to be given up. Sometimes the changes are hard. Uh, how can repentance be healing for our souls? Well, repentance is somewhat of a repair, isn't it? We're repairing things. If something that's, that's, that's not right, it's, it's wrong, it needs to be fixed. And so we're repairing that. And as we repair that, you know, we try to is just to uh, make it better, smooth it over, make it uh, better, make it put it back where it was, or restore it. Those kind of concepts are associated with repentance. And so it heals our souls. It, it, it fills in those holes that we've made because of mistakes. Exactly, exactly. It does, it, it, absolutely. You know, sin recognizing in our lives, it's a burden, isn't it? It's just, we know things aren't right. We want, we want things to be different, but you know, we have to work to make that happen. We can't just carry it around with us. And uh, God's given us that avenue to, to just let go of it. You know, do the best you can. Some things you may not be able to do restitution for, 
or you may not be able to repair, but you do the best you can, and then you learn to move on because God has forgiven us, and he gives us that avenue. All right, next week we're going to be talking about confession, and uh, so look at Lesson 7 when you get a chance, and we'll be ready to start that next week. Thanks for being here.